This is Duke University. Today I wanted to um, talk about a sequence of experiments I've um, done over the last, I don't know, five or six years on um, looking at sex differences in aggression um, using the context of an experimental crisis simulation game. And I started with a series of experiments um, that were originally run at Cornell, um, later developed and computerized for um, a version of experiments at Harvard that also involved looking at um, uh, testosterone and uh, cortisol through um, saliva samples. And most recently um, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, looking at um, a genetic marker on monoamine oxidase um, on aggression as well, although that was only done in men. Those men who fight and lose are the ones who have the highest initial uh, testosterone. So they're going in there, they're fighting, and they're losing. So they're basically taking risks that, that are not calculated risks. Um, they're certainly more likely to engage in unprovoked attack, meaning an attack that takes place before, before they themselves are attacked. As I mentioned, we also looked at cortisol. We didn't get a lot of results out of cortisol, but one of the, cortisol is a stress-related hormone. Um, one of the things that we did find is that men with lower cortisol um, were more likely to engage in unprovoked attack. This didn't completely make sense to us because you'd think that higher levels of stress would make you more likely to attack. This assumes that people have lower levels of stress and they're more likely to attack. That wasn't always clear to us. Narcissism is the only personality effect that really affects the likelihood of unprovoked attack. This is true whether or not you're male or female. So if you're a narcissistic female, you're much more likely to attack, just like if you're a narcissistic male, you're more likely to attack. On the other personality um, scales, men tended to um, overrate their own hostility, competitiveness, skill, and intelligence relative to their partner more than women did. And I mentioned skill with um, the asterisks because that's the thing that they overrate the most. It's extremely consistent with Jennifer Lawless's quite interesting work on why you can't get women to run for office. It's completely validating of, of, the, of the Lawless and Fox hypothesis about it's not that women who um, run don't win, it's that you can't get them to run. And a lot of that is about overconfidence, right? And she tells this phenomenally wonderful story that I just adore about um, going around asking people, candidates, about um, whether or not they've been recruited to run. So she interviews this man, and he, she's like, well, why did you decide to run? He's like, I was recruited. And um, she said, great, tell me the story. How'd you be, how were you recruited? Who recruited you? And he said that um, he had been waiting for a plane, he went into a bar in the airport. He sat down, he ordered a drink. Uh, CNN was on. He started commenting on what was on CNN. And the bartender said to him, you know, you're really smart. You should run for office. <laughs> that was his notion of being recruited. He was dead serious. He ran. He won. So I want you to see what typical messages look like. This is a typical male pair. Uh, first guy. Uh, says, you will die, haha, ha, the streets will flow with the blood of the Paduans. His respondent does not reply to this message. Next round, he starts out not having gotten a response to the you will die and says, go to hell. Um, and his, his uh, partner then responds, don't ever make feeble attempts to scare me. I may just claim Lenora as my own. Next round, you think I care about my people? They are dog. Okay, not great grammar, but... Um, I start war for my own pleasure, ha, ha, ha. Response, disarm at once, you will lose. Uh, I'm safe in my bunker. Again, not great, not great, uh, not great grammar. Come and try to get me, you pansies. Uh, response, enough games, bring it on. At which point they both devote all of their existing <laughs> time to war. They blow up their... Um, uh, they blow up their world. Uh, you'll notice this is not a six rounds of play. This is one, two, three, four rounds of play. They annihilate their world um, at the end of the fourth round of play. This game does not go to six rounds. These are the very hostile messages. 
Highly salient, concrete communication is very emotional. <laughs> Buy black, you'll need it for your funeral. I'm going to destroy you, you will lose, you will be crying for mercy. If you surrender now, I will not kill your family. Oh wait, I think I already did. Don't worry, you'll be seeing me soon in hell. And um, this shows the relationship between aggression and confidence. So as people got more confident, they became more aggressive. Or as people became more aggressive, they became more confident, however you want to frame it. And uh, aggression in politics. So this is a seven point scale from most liberal to most conservative. So the most conservative people um, demonstrated the highest level of aggression. Most liberal people demonstrated lower levels of aggression. That was very significant. Testosterone had these kind of, um, you know, instructive effects, but they weren't definitive. So it was playing a role in what was going on, but it couldn't explain the differences within um, men themselves. It couldn't explain all the differences in aggression within men. And so I started thinking about what other aspect of being, you know, sort of ineluctably male could explain some of these aggressive um, outcomes I was seeing. Um, and so I started looking at um, different genetic markers that had been indicated to be associated with um, uh, aggression. And the most obvious one to look at was monoamine oxidase. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.